Hi, everybody. Professor Hyman, IBIS 620, Research Methods in International Business and Markets. Today, we're going to talk about the structure of a research paper. Now, we're going to talk about this because it's good knowledge to have, and there may be something about this on the final exam or one of the other exams, but uh, one of the midterms. But uh, the truth is, you don't have to write a research paper in this class because that's beyond the scope of the material that this class covers. It's just simply too much to ask of you. You may have noticed that there's an awful lot of sections and an awful lot of chunks of discrete knowledge that you have to internalize for this class. And it's too much to ask you to put it all together in a one semester class. So, but let's go over this anyway. You need to look at it. And, and who knows, there may be an extra credit assignment on this subject, which will give you an opportunity to look at a research paper. OK. So starting from the top left, as usual, on the structure of a research paper, it has seven parts. There's an abstract, an introduction, a literature review, the testable hypotheses, the methods and the data, the findings, and then the conclusion. Let me break each one of those down briefly for you. More detail is always possible, but I want to just give you the outline of what goes into each section. So the abstract, which is usually 150 to 200 words. That varies depending on, on who you're writing the paper for. The abstract gives away the ending. It tells you what you found. It tells the reader what you found. Uh, you say stuff like, we tested this research question, and this is what we found, and here are some possible issues, very, very briefly, and here is our contribution. And you do this all in, in, in a one sentence each for each point type of setup of 150 to 200 words. Some, some places allow an abstract of 300 words. I'm, I'm OK with that. Uh, but typically, 150 to 200 is more common. So ab the abstract stands alone. So it's people read the abstract instead of reading the paper to see if they're interested in reading the whole paper. That's the purpose of the abstract. So again, the most important part about the abstract is it gives away the ending. It doesn't set up any suspense. OK, number two, and probably of great importance, similar to the abstract, is the introduction. The introduction is you talk about the big picture. Why is this paper being written? What is your motivation for the paper? Then you talk about where our study fits into the big picture, what your research question is, and very briefly, what your approach is. And this is, in, in just a couple of sentences, uh, what your approach is with the data, the methods, and the analysis. I'll give you an example of that because it's, it's hard to imagine that without an example. Our approach is to gather data using a survey from 600 managers uh, working in startups in Finland, and we perform a regression analysis to make our determination. That's, that's something like what you would put in for our approach. Uh, number three. Moving onwards, the literature review. This is a short, essayistic, no math or anything type of section where you answer questions like, what do we already know about the research question? The research, which I've abbreviated question, Q, I've abbreviated there too. Where are the knowledge gaps? Question mark, let me get a question mark there. OK. And how does our paper fill in at least one gap? This is a big justification for the paper itself. So you say, what do we know? What do we not know? And how does our paper contribute to fixing the stuff that we don't know about? OK? That's the literature review. In a, in a standard paper, those can be anywhere from two to five pages long. They're pretty easy to write because you, you look up what you are, what's already known, you do a few strategic searches through an academic database, and you find what you need, and you cite the authors and what they found, and then you say what they missed or what they did wrong, and then you say how your paper helps fill in the gap. Moving on, number four, you want to argue for and state the testable hypotheses. And, and you could call this section just something as simple as testable hypotheses. That would be fine. And so you have some verbiage, which is this, this is my little symbol for there's some writing there. You have some verbiage, which explains the logic of, let's say, your hypothesis H1. And then at the end of that verbiage, 
you state H1 as temperature increases, sales of ice cream in Japan increase. Period. Then you repeat this process for each hypothesis. Explain the logic, give a little justification, then state the hypothesis. A good research paper tests a minimum of two or three research hypotheses, but this depends on the subject and how difficult it is to perform the tests. But I'm generalizing here, but I think this is applicable to social sciences. A great research paper might test more hypotheses, four, five, six hypotheses. Now let's talk about the next section, which is the methods and the data. There's, you, here you describe the population, the sampling methods, and the actual sample characteristics. You mention anything odd or strange or unique about your sample that might be an issue. You discuss how your variables were constructed, and this is a table. And I have a, I have a video on the variable construction, constructing the variable uh, construction table. Uh, then you present your descriptive analysis, which is, a, which is another table. And uh, then you present your correlation matrix. And, and if there's any problematically high correlations, you mention those. And again, I've got videos on variable construction table, on the descriptive analysis table, and on the correlation matrix table. Then findings. And this is where you put your regression coefficients table. This is the meat of the matter. This is where the rubber meets the road, and you're, you're showing the reader what you found out. OK, so that's another table. There's a whole video on making and interpreting regression coefficient tables. You should look at that video. It's probably the most important video of the course. Um, in addition to presenting that table, you want to discuss which hypotheses are supported. Never say proven. Never say we proved that H1 is true. You say H1 is strongly supported. That's about the, 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 the most emphatic thing you can say, because you're never sure that something is true, especially in social sciences. Uh, what was not supported? Which hypotheses were not supported? Why? And here you have to speculate. Perhaps H2 would have been supported if we had had a, uh, a larger sample, for instance. Uh, that's, that's a speculative outcome, but what you're saying is we think H2 is probably true, but our sample wasn't big enough to show that it was true. Um, then really the finding section is, is very short, and then the conclusion, which is also somewhat short, page or two at the most, uh, would be for you to review the research question and your findings very briefly, because you just discussed the findings in the section before, uh, and then state your contribution to the field here. Be concrete about this. And then finally, this is something that a lot of people skip, which is a bad idea. You want to discuss at the end, the very end of your paper, issues and future research direction. So issues might be problems with your survey, OK? Uh, we, our sample might have been too small. We should get data from more countries. That's a common one in international business research. OK, you got data from the US, China, and Finland. What about the rest of Europe? What about the rest of Asia? What about South America, which you excluded completely? Uh, so that's, that's an example of a common issue in international business. And then future directions, you can, you can state what the future directions should be, suggestions for future directions, based somewhat on your issues. So researchers should think of more hypotheses to test new biases in problem discovery. Uh, we should run these same surveys in more countries. These are future directions for any researcher who's looking to pick up the ball and run with it on your research topic. So that's a brief explanation of the structure of a research paper. I hope you have a chance to put this into action one day. But as I said, at this introductory class level, the actual writing of a research paper is beyond the scope of this class. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I enjoyed preparing it and giving it to you. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye.